What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the JT Sports Podcast. I'm your host, JT, joined by my guy, Artie. He's an NFL scout for film, is a art. Make sure to go ahead and subscribe to his channel. Check out his podcast, man. He uploads some pretty good content over there. We'll leave the link to it down in the description and the pinned comment section down below, man. What's going on, fam? What's going on, JT? How you doing, brother? It's a... Uh... It's good to be back on here with you. It's good to be back, uh, you know, during peak season for us, draft season. So, um, yeah, just happy to be on here, happy to be able to talk ball with you again. Yeah, man, I'm doing good. It's just cold as hell down here in South Florida, bro. I don't know when it started getting so cold, but it's in the 50s right now, bro, and I I'm not liking it, bro. I'm a Floridian. I live in the state of Florida for a reason, and it's not to be cold. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm from um I'm from NC, so uh it gets it gets all right here. Like Virginia gets colder than us, um but yeah, it's to be cold in South Florida. That's a that that sounds crazy. <laughs> you know what is cold though? The cold takes that I keep seeing on social media about Caleb Williams being overrated, bro. Like I I, I if you think Caleb Williams is overrated. I question if you're even watching the games, bro. To me, he looks like a generational quarterback. He can make all the throws outside the pocket, inside the pocket. He's an incredible athlete. He has good enough athleticism where he's the equivalent to a running back, especially with the way that his body's built. He's 6'1", 215 pounds. He can run through guys. There's not any throw that he can't make, and I just don't get the whole narrative that he's overrated and with you being the nfl scout bro like am i tripping are people right about Caleb williams being overrated overhyped like what's going on bro i mean to be completely honest with you it's kind of one of those things where it's like he's been talked about for so long he's been praised so much they have to find a reason to tear him down. It's the same thing we literally just went through last year with Bryce Young. This man was the Heisman Trophy winner. He threw for almost 5,000 yards in his so true sophomore season at the University of Alabama, playing against SEC competition all year. And now him being 5'10 is a problem. Now him being 185, 185 pounds is a problem. Now the arm strength is wonky at best. You know what I'm saying? It's one of those things to where when you're great and you're so great for so long, they try to find a reason to tear you down. And for me with Caleb, it's like the only really thing you can really complain about or have a gripe about with Caleb is his maturity. Like, okay, yes, he puts the ball on the ground a lot. He fumbles. But you know what else fumbles a lot? Lamar Jackson. Lamar Jackson fumbles a ton. You know who else fumbles a lot? Patrick Mahomes, who is my comp for him. So it's 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 just nitpicking. It's just it's just um talk to push their narrative. I found out a lot in our community, bro, that people sometimes try to say something that might be false or might be far fetched to get their own thought out there so they can get the click of the day or whatever. So this old Caleb Williams thing, in my humble opinion, is just a bunch of people that are trying to tear down a prospect who is built out of vibranium. Now, are the character issues or the mature maturity issues really a, a huge deal? Like, is this something that could be problematic down the road or is it just some light skin shit because you know how light skins tend to be at times we can be a little emotional you know like people are making a big deal about him crying after losing to washington like oh he's crying they just lost like this is really who you guys think should go number one like what i would say to that is if i'm an nfl team that is the best thing that I could see from a college quarterback. To see someone who is giving their all for their team. I mean, all. That Washington game specifically. He was running around. He was juking people out their shoes. Like, he was doing all he could to help that team with that horrendous defense win the game. 
So the crying after the game wasn't because he's emotional and light skin. The crying after the game is, bro, I gave my all for my team, and it wasn't enough. Defense, but the maturity them. issues, yeah, as always. But you know, but the 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 uh, maturity issue is, in you know when he throws an interception, or when he has a fumble. He'll he'll blame other people instead of himself. He like he he like he he has this passive aggressive thing where, you know, when it comes to the me comes talking to the media, you know, he'll he'll say things, you know, like, well, we got to start we got to start uh being more efficient with our run game, you know. It's just just little things like that that uh worry me from maturity aspect. There's also some things I've heard that he's done off the field. It's nothing crazy like he hasn't hit a woman or nothing like that, but. Just some things that he that he's done and um well he's hitting those strip clubs. You know it's LA. Uh you could you could say that, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So if anything, he may be another James Harden is what is what I'm hearing. Which hey, if you going out there and you're doing your thing on the field, I don't got no problem with how many dollars you want to throw in the club. Now, how big is the gap? Between Caleb Williams and the rest of the quarterbacks in the class, such as a Michael Penix, a Jaden Daniels, and a Drake May, because that's been another popular narrative that I've been hearing. Drake May is better than Caleb Williams. Michael Penix is better than Caleb Williams. Yeah, so as far as the other quarterbacks in this class go, um, the gap between Caleb Williams and Drake May is like, you know, here, right? It's not it's not Bryce and, and CJ, but it's like here, right? Like it's like a gap, but it's not to a point to where it's like Caleb Williams is out of this world better than Drake May. Like you could actually have a conversation about it. Absolutely. Caleb Williams and Michael Penix and Bo Nix and Jaden Daniels and Spencer Rattler, insert name, whoever you want to put in there, it's not close. And the reason why is two. One, the athleticism. Other than Jaden Daniels, no quarterback in this class is the athlete that Caleb Williams is. Not one. It, it, it's, it's not up for debate. Two, no one in this class has a better arm than Caleb. Caleb's arm is phenomenal. Like, it's not like Bryce's arm to where it's good. It's great because of the accuracy. It's not good because of the strength. He has both. He has the arm strength and the accuracy. He throws good from the pocket and on the move. He he operates well in chaos and without chaos. A lot of those quarterbacks I just named can't do those things. Michael Penix isn't as efficient throwing on the run. Jaden Daniels isn't as efficient throwing from the from from the pocket in structure all the time. Bo Nix is not as efficient when the play breaks down. When he gets outside the pocket, he's less accurate than he is when he's in the pocket in short throwing a pass outside. So it's like almost comparing, you know, grapes to oranges. It's like they're not they're not the same. And you bring up Michael Penix. Michael Penix had an incredible performance a couple of days ago against Texas in the Sugar Bowl. This dude was looking really impressive when it came to his deep ball accuracy. He had really good pocket movement and pocket presence. He's had an extensive injury history. Like nearly every single year he played at Indiana, his season got cut short. Where do you think he's going to end up getting drafted at? Are the medicals going to come back positive? Is this going to be something that hinders him from being a top 15 pick? Because, I mean, I would love to see this dude in a black and gold. So let him fall all the way down to Pittsburgh. And I pray to God we scoop him up because God knows we need some quarterback help. What do you think about Michael Penix? Where would you draft him? Yeah, so I am... As we've talked about in our in our private conversation, JT, I'm not a prisoner of the moment. So the Sugar Bowl didn't really like sway me either way. Like I already had my feelings on Penix and I like him. But what I can say about Penix, I have his uh, scouting report put up right here. Um, the downfield accuracy obviously stands out. You saw it on the throws to Romo Dunze, the throws to Jalen Polk, right? In the Sugar Bowl, the downfield accuracy is outstanding. Um, processes and go processes and goes through his reads really well 
And um, despite not having the strongest arm, he throws with some nice zipping velocity, right? I mean, some of those throws that came off of his hand at the Sugar Bowl look like they came out of a rocket. Now, when you look at him, he doesn't look like a guy with a strong arm. But when you can throw in zip and velocity, your arm strength doesn't matter. Where would so, you rank his arm strength? That. Like one through five? Because I remember last year watching him against Oregon State. And I don't mean like 2023 season, 2022, when they were playing like 40 mile per hour wind gusts. And he threw a 40 yard dot and 40 mile per hour winds and a cover two hole shot. So where where is his arm strength on a one through five scale for you? I give him a I give him a four. Um it's not it's not great. It's good. But I think I think what he what what he makes up for it with is his accuracy. Now, something something that I was willing to see more of was more consistent accuracy, you know, in the intermediate, specifically to the outside intermediate areas of the field, and he improved on that this season. Um so as far as where I would take him. I am comfortable taking him starting at pick 14, 15. Mid mid first rounds where I'm comfortable taking him. If I'm a quarterback needy team. But where I think he will go, it all obviously all depends on the medicals, right? All depends on because this man is coming off, you know, two torn ACLs, um, a shoulder injury, and they all had, you know, to be season ending injuries. So it all depends on how these teams feel about its medicals. But I truly think Michael Penix is going to go between 20 and 40. 20 what? And 40. I think he's going to be a late first to a mid-second. And the reason I say that is because, you know, with the injury, with the, when, we, when, we, when we find out about how teams feel about the medicals at the combine, that's when I'll be able to, you know, comfortably say, okay, top 15. Like just because I'm comfortable with taking him top fifteen doesn't mean the NFL other other NFL teams are. You know what I'm saying? I've learned that lesson as we've gone through this scouting thing a couple of times, where it's like just because you like a player at a certain point, you also have to evaluate where certain teams would like players. Because the injuries, you know, history, it does matter. Now, maintaining a bill of health for two years will help that. But as far as right now, as 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 far as what I would do, I'm comfortable taking him about starting at pick fourteen. For NFL teams, I think the 20s um, to the mid 40s would be where they are comfortable taking him. Because Did at the end of the day, he is he is a um, is a very very good you know pocket passer. So yeah. Now his mobility is that something that is going to be useless once he gets to the NFL? Is he not going to be able to move outside the pocket or pick up anything with his legs at all? Because the injuries that he suffered at Indiana definitely took away from his athleticism. He used to be really mobile, like a really great athlete. And all of a sudden, it kind of looks like he's a little bit shot in a sense. When we saw him running in the Sugar Bowl, it's like, it kind of looked a little bit weird to me. You feel me? Like, he yeah. was picking up yards, but it looked a little bit weird if you get what I'm saying. So, it's like, is he just going to be one of those guys that's just strictly going to be able to move in the pocket and that's about it? And he's going to be a statue elsewhere? Or he could pick up a little bit of yards here and there? Yeah, so, I think, I think, and this is something that we discussed on a little bit on our first episode of our podcast, um, called 100 Yards in Context. We've gotten to the point as far as quarterbacks, not only in the NFL, but just quarterbacks in general, where they're, where the pocket passer only is kind of going extinct, right? So my rule is, and how I evaluate quarterbacks is, can you get me seven on third and six? I think Michael Penis can get you seven on third and six if you need it. But he's not just going to take it every time. You know, he's going to be a guy that's going to try to pat the ball. He's going to try to throw the ball to the right place. And it, also, I think that he's type of – there's some quarterbacks that only run in big games or big situations. I would classify him more as that, as to where he's willing to run, but only when it really matters and you got to have it. I think at the end of the day, those injuries are something that still factors into his mind. But I wouldn't classify him as immobile. You know, he's not Jared Goff. You know, I think I think that I think that he can move um, – and manipulate the pocket 
well enough and even scramble well enough, you know, to pick up yardage if, if it need be. Sean Payton needs a quarterback. And we know how with Drew Brees, he wants somebody that's operational in the pocket, gets the ball out fast, can go through progressions and plays well within structure. Does Michael Penix fit the mold of a Sean Payton quarterback? Yeah, so my comp for Michael Penix Jr., giving it to you early, you guys are getting the goods here, uh, is uh, Phillip Rivers. So I think, I think um, first of all, Sean Payton can work with anyone. This is the same coach that had Taysom Hill at a 4-1 record in the 2021 NFL season. So Sean Payton can work with any quarterback, but a quarterback as talented, you know, with his arm as Michael Penix would fit, you know, great. But Sean Payton won because he would be able to trust him to throw the ball down the field. And as of right now, we don't know how it's going to work out. But as of right now, they have, um, you know, guys like Marvin Mims, guys like Jerry Judy, guys that can stretch the field, guys that are good route runners. So Michael Pinks be able to hit those hole shots, be able to hit, hit those seam routes for them and everything. As far as, um, you know, everything else, like, you know, processing, reading defenses. Like I said, you know, that's one of Pinks' strengths. And also, I think that Peyton would like him due to the fact that he's 24, right? So he's older. So it's like you're getting a rookie who has some experience, who has some, you know, um, awareness of how things work to where the speed of the game, the learning the playbook won't be as, you know, won't need 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 to be as simplified as will be for like an Anthony Richardson or, you know, a, um, you know, a, you know, a young developing quarterback, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah, I think, I think Sean Payton uh, would honestly be a person who I, if I'm the Broncos, I'm thinking about trading up uh, for Michael Penix or someone like that. Me and you last year around this time were both high on Bryce Young. What the hell has went wrong with him in Carolina, bro? It's been a fucking shit show down there. The coaching staff has failed him. The roster has failed him. But how much of Carolina's terrible season lies on Bryce Young? Yeah, so for me, I think you said it in your in your statement, in, your, in the way you set up your question, you know, it's failed him, right? Because... Jonathan Mingo was their second round draft pick, right? Wide receiver. Do you want to know what Jonathan Mingo's separation rate was this season? I really don't, it but 50... <laughs> <laughs> it was 50.3. That ranks third worst in the entire NFL. The entire league. So when you factor that in, when you factor that Bryce Young is one of the most sacked quarterbacks in the NFL, when you factor in that his offensive play caller got switched three times and then got fired, being his head coach, I mean, he was he was never set up for success in Carolina. It was almost like, hey, we have number one pick. We have Bryce Young, so that's all that matters. We're going to be fine. And that's not how it works all the time. There are going to be times where you're going to have to surround that number one pick with talent. It's the same thing that the, the the Chicago Bears are looking at right now. It's uh, do you do you do you trade Justin Fields, start over with that fresh new quarterback, or do you surround Justin Fields with the talent that he deserves, and see what you got? So yeah, for Bryce, it's not that you know what what's going on with him. It's why would a team draft him and have a, a proper plan to on how to make him successful. What now the Alabama Bryce Young I felt look way better than the Bryce Young that we've seen in the NFL and there's things that he never did at Alabama that he's doing in the National Football League his decision making was never this bad is it the speed of the game has been too much for him or has he just been getting his ass kicked so bad to the point where he he just has lost all sense of what he used to be. And plus his athleticism, like for a guy that's 5'10", maybe 5'9", maybe smaller, like this dude doesn't move like incredibly well. And that kind of shocks me because in the SEC, you're going against some of the best athletes in college football. So if you can be able to sustain and be this size in the SEC, you would think that this would somewhat be able to translate to the NFL to a certain extent. Like, 
What things have you seen out of Bryce Young that have alarmed you from a regression standpoint? So I don't. I wouldn't categorize it as regression. I would categorize it as look at the offensive lines that he had in Alabama, and look at the line he has now. That's not to say that there aren't some plays to where he's holding the ball too long. He's not identifying the blitzers. He's getting fooled on blitzes. But there's a cl- c- clear difference in the protection that he had when he was at Alabama and the protection that he has in Carolina. That line is horrible. And being that he's 5'9", he needs to have a strong line in front of him so that he can get the ball out quickly to those receivers. Because that's the difference between college and pro. In college, everything is – Fast, fast, but everybody's at the same, pretty much the same speed and the same mental. In the NFL, everything is faster, and people may be faster or slower, but the mental is is there. So, you know, I think the best example of that is the first game of the year for, for the Carolina Panthers. Bryce Young threw two picks to the same person in the same uh, defensive coverage. Because they were baiting him into it. A lot of times when Bryce was on the field at Alabama, he was the smartest person on the field. So when you're not the smartest person on the field anymore, and you're also behind a bad offensive line with the receivers that aren't getting open, you're going to have times and plays where you look like, you know, you've regressed. But in reality, it's a totality type situation. It's like, yes, he did not make all the throws, all the plays that he made at Alabama when he was a Heisman Trophy winner. But a lot of it has more to do with his situation more than him as a talent. Because it's also there was also some times on tape I saw him make some of those same plays that were drops. Make some of them same plays that, um, you know, the receiver didn't run his route at a good enough depth. See what I'm saying? So it's just a lot of factors that go into it. But overall, I think that Bryce uh, – did not have the year that he anticipated. But I think if the Carolina Panthers are smart, they uh, this offseason will be able to surround him with more talent, surround him with better receivers, uh, give, get him, give him more offensive linemen, and uh, he'll have a much better season next season. Puka Nakua has been, without a doubt, the best rookie wideout in the NFL this year, and he was a fifth-round selection. Where the hell did teams miss on Puka Nakua at? Or what was wrong with him coming out of BYU that allowed the Rams to get such a big steal? To be honest on Puka, I think a lot of it was the school he went to. I think after the Zach Wilson situation, I think they saw BYU as kind of like, you know, you guys produce athletes and everything, but... It's hard to see what you guys do in that scheme and that system translating to the NFL. What they forgot was, is that sometimes it's not about the scheme, it's about the players. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. I did not watch much of Puka Nakua's tape when he was coming out of BYU. But from what I did see, I did see a nice route runner. I did see someone who had the ability to stretch the field at times. But I think what happened with Puka was he had a little bit of a injury history at BYU. So maybe the medical scared them away. But beyond that, what he did in the preseason, what he did this season for the Los Angeles Rams was outstanding. Simply put, it was it was outstanding. And honestly, I think the bigger question is, did they find – the new wide receiver one because when you look at the targets, Puka is getting more targets than Cup, not just you know pre injury but post injury from Cooper Cup coming back. So the Rams not might, might have not only lucked into you know the offensive rookie of the year potentially, but they might have found their Cooper Cup replacement because Cooper Cup, as I'm sure maybe we'll talk about another time, he's looking like he's on the downside of his career. Quickly, so yeah, which is which is very very interesting. So yeah, Puka Nakua, man, shout out to you. You're you're a stud, and I need to start taking BYU players more seriously. <laughs> yeah, bro, because that I, I I saw this dude. I heard Brett Coleman talking about him, 
And when I saw him pop up on my fantasy football draft and I just need to fill out some guys on the bench, I'm like, man, fuck it. Like, Brett Coleman was hiring this dude. I don't know too much about him, but I like his name. Puka Nakua sounds pretty cool to me. He sounds fun to say. I'm going to pick him up. Uh, next thing you know, I start him in my line. No, week two, I was like, holy shit. Like, this dude just might win me my league. Now, of course, like, I still lost my league. Didn't even make it to the playoffs. And I had Tank Dell, too, by the way. You feel me? It, the the and the cool story it is crazy as hell. And what about this other rookie that keeps going crazy for the Los Angeles Rams that's in the rookie of the year conversation on the defense side of the football? I'm pretty sure you know who I'm talking about. I'm trying to uh, I'm trying to think. I'm trying to Kobe think. Turner. Exactly. Kobe yeah. Turner, him. Interior pass rusher. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the Rams, other than the Detroit Lions, other than Houston Texans might have had one of the best drafts from the class of 2023. Because not only do they have their, you know, potential Cooper Cup replacement, but now when Aaron Donald gets stuck at you guys losing, now you have an interior defender that can have a similar type of impact. I mean, Kobe Turner has nine sacks, bro. Nine. On a line with Byron Young, on a line with Aaron Donald, like that's a that's a lot of production from the inside, you know, getting to the quarterback. So, but I I knew about Kobe Turner. That's the thing. I I, I knew about Kobe Turner. I knew that he was really good. I think he was a senior ball guy as well, like Puka. So, um, yeah, I'm not surprised by his success. He was one of my favorite interior defensive linemen, uh, one of our favorite at the at the department. Um, yeah. What he's doing is not surprising. I, I I thought that he would go a little later than he did, but regardless, he he's having an outstanding season. And I love I love the fact that you know he gets to learn from Aaron Donald. Because a lot of these guys, when they come to the league, when they have early success, they're either on bad teams or they have bad leaders. What better interior defensive lineman to learn from than Aaron Donald, bro? I mean, he's probably one of the greatest ever. So, yeah, shout out to Kobe Turner. He he was a very, very fun prospect to scout, and I'm glad that his rookie season is going the way it's going. I'm looking at it right now. Byron Young, he has seven sacks. It's just like the Rams just were the gift that kept on giving. It's like they went from fuck those picks to now we about to kill you with all these picks. And they had one of the biggest draft hauls out of any team, undrafted, during the draft. It's crazy how they've just dominated the draft, and it looks like they're going to be a a force to be reckoned with in the NFC for the next foreseeable future. Last thing before we let you get on out of here, you know we got to talk about it. We're going to have the NFL's most anticipated quarterback decision in the history of this league everybody wants to know what the hell is going to happen with justin fields rather if you're a bears fan or a packers fan or a fan of anybody else everybody's discussing justin fields future i believe the bears should just move on from justin fields he's not a bad quarterback he's not a great quarterback he's a middle of the pack quarterback you see what justin fields is that you get these splash games like Atlanta when he went off and he became the new part-time owner of the Falcons. But then you get performances like what we saw against the Cleveland Browns when he doesn't look that good. And people like to make excuses. Well, the line isn't this and the wide receivers aren't that. But we were making these same excuses for Justin Fields last year. You get DJ Moore. You get an improved offensive line. You got one of the best rookie offensive tackles in the league in Darnell Wright. So at this point, I think it's better for Chicago to just reset, start over. Justin Fields gets a fresh start. I just don't see the consistency as a passer to be sustainable for Chicago to have success. He will be much suited going to an offensive-minded coach. Not saying it has to be Arthur Smith, but even though Kevin O'Connell, somebody who just has a better understanding of how to maximize a talent like this, because the talent is there. You feel me? Like, Justin Fields, if he goes to the right coach, this dude is damn near a top five, top ten quarterback in the league. It's just that who can help him take that next step as a passer? So what do you think the Bears should do? Should they keep him or should they trade him? I disagree with you. I think they should keep him. And the reason why is, so earlier this season, I would have agreed with you because of how he played. But since he's come back from his thumb injury, he's been lights out, bro. Um. 
I get the Bears game, but what they were able to do to Detroit, what they were able to do to Atlanta, you know, what they were able to do to the other teams they played since then. Um, I think they played Minnesota as well. Um, yeah, he's been fantastic. Um, he, recently, I think DJ Moore went over a thousand yards um, a couple games ago. Now he's at a thousand three hundred. Like their connection has been outstanding. He's got like a um, seventy-three or something percent completion rate when he throws to DJ Moore. Um, that connection is outstanding. And beyond that, um, he's just learning now how to manage his athleticism which is something I was very big on. I did a film session on it um, at the channel. Um, just learning how to, when it's time to go as a runner and when it's time to stay as a passer. And he and he seemed like he's mastered that now. He's sliding. He's not, he's avoiding bigger hits. You know what I'm saying? And overall, I think the city and the, and the fans are behind him. You know, when, when, when you have, when you have a, when you have a city or your, or your, or your team that you play for is chanting, we want fields during your game, as an ownership, how can you trade that young man? How? You're, 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 the people are telling you what they want. And beyond that, you know, I get the whole improved line. You have wide receiver DJ Moore, but we all, we both know that's not enough. You know, the, the, the Eagles had Devontae Smith. They still traded for yeah, AJ, AJ Brown. Brown. Yep. Yep. So you're saying Marvin you Harrison know, Jr. And it is deadly. It's up from there. Well, well, not just that, but they also have their pick. They have they have the first pick from the Panthers, but they also have their pick. They can package that pick and move up for offensive tackle. They can take another wide receiver. They can take a tight end. They can do whatever they want. It, 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 if you're going to make a decision about trading a quarterback, in my humble opinion, you have to see that quarterback at their best with the best possible arsenal you have to offer. The Chicago Bears are going to lead the NFL besides, I think, the Cardinals in cap space this offseason. If you don't surround Justin Fields with all the talent that you can and see what you got, at that point, you you played yourself. Because guess what? If you trade him to another team and they do that, and then Justin Fields go to a championship game or a Super Bowl, how are you going to feel? You're going to be stuck with Caleb Williams and DJ Moore and, and cap space. And, DJ, and, and for context, Caleb Williams might not have the same feeling about being stuck with DJ Moore as you as know Justin Fields. Justin Fields has right now. Yeah. So it's it's give and take, you know what I'm saying? It's 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 uh it's a tough decision, but at the end of the day, in my opinion, I think you go with the safer unknown. Because that's all the draft picks are, right? It's all that young players are, right? Unknown. unknown. The safer unknown is the unknown that you've unknown that you've seen the past few years and the unknown that you wouldn't have to, you know, change life in your franchise over you know if you draft caleb williams number one you have to you know you know put him into the system that you have with justin Fields. you're just adding to the system you're adding a marvin harris jr you're adding potentially a brock ballard romo dunze whoever you want to add as a pass catcher you're adding an offensive lineman like joe alt or olu fashanu or jc latham you're adding to you're adding to the piece of the puzzle and you have players on your team supporting him. DJ Morris came out several times and said, fuck all the Caleb Williams talk. Like, Justin Fields is my quarterback. When you have your wide receiver one, who you traded for, by the way, saying stuff like that, I mean, what can you what 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 can ownership say? Are you really gonna sit there and tell your fans after Justin Fields has performed the way he's performed after his injury? After the fans have chanting for him to stay, after players on a team are saying Justin Fields is our QB one, you're gonna trade him? Come on, man. That's that's. If they, and if like, the Bears trade him, then the Bears are the Bears. And I like Justin Fields. You know, he's arguably my favorite player in the league. I just want to see him. You know, I really want to see him go to Minnesota or the Atlanta Falcons without Arthur Smith. If they were to trade for Justin Fields and hire Ben Johnson in Atlanta with what they have and Justin Fields, oh my goodness. Like, I'm just trying to push her agenda, bro. Like, I really want to see him with the offensive-minded coach. I don't trust Matt Eberflus to make the right decision at OC. I do feel like they're underutilizing him and his strengths, and he hasn't really developed to, you know, his full potential yet. But if 
like you said, they had cap space. They do have a lot of draft capital to, you know, improve the team around them. But it's like, damn, bro, in Minnesota, with Jay Jettas, Jordan Addison, a healthy TJ Hawkinson, with Kevin O'Connell dialing up the plays, like... I don't see how the Vikings yeah. don't win the Super Bowl with that. I don't see how the Falcons on the threat in the NFC with that. But at the same time, if you're a Bears fan, you're like, man, F those teams, bro. Like, we love Justin. And they would chant, we want Justin the other day. So, I mean, hey, you know, like, I personally just want to see him with the proven head coach. That That's all I have. You feel me? I don't really think it's necessarily like... He's not good enough to lead Chicago to success. I really just don't like the regime that's around him. But everybody, this is my guy, Artie, NFL scout, director of film is an art. Make sure that you guys go ahead, subscribe to this channel, check out this podcast. Let the people know where they can find you at and what you got planned for the channel and the pod over the next couple of months. Yeah, thank you again for having me, JT. Appreciate you as always, brother. Um, and it's draft season, y'all. So um, <laughs> we we are a lot rocking and rolling. Um, we've released three all twenty two film sessions on players um, from the upcoming class: um, Jaden Daniels, um, Keon Coleman, wide receiver from Florida State, and um, Braylon Allen, the running back from um, Wisconsin. So we're rocking and rolling um as you also as JT also said we have our podcast called 100 yards in context it's a podcast exclusively and um primarily dedicated to you know NFL draft content and uh some light NFL content as well and then we also have our um weekly NFL pregame show called the Sunday Spiral where we get you ready for you know the NFL action that you should expect to see that next week so we have a lot to offer um we have a lot out we're probably gonna have i think an excess of over 100 videos come out over the next four to five months so uh if you ever get bored need to go down a rabbit hole come to film miss art we got your back all right everybody this is already make sure you guys go check him out one last time film is the art link will be down in the description and pink comment section he has a podcast out also and don't forget to give the JT Sports Podcast a five-star review. We are available on all podcasting platforms, Apple, Google, Spotify, Amazon. Y'all know where to find the JT Sports Podcast. Appreciate you guys for tuning in, and we will see you guys shortly with another episode.